Welcome to this session where we're going to, it's going to be a case-based session uh, where we're going to, to cover both uh, what is the, actually the evidence for this procedure, LAA closure, in patients with atrial fibrillation. We're going to talk about how, how to optimize the outcome, do a proper pre-procedural evaluation of the patient, how to carry out a safe procedure, and also how to manage these patient uh, safety afterwards. So I just have a very few slides here I'm going to show you before we start. So we know if you look at the patient who actually have atrial fibrillation with an indication for anticoagulation, both in the US and in the Europe, and you try to subdivide them into those patients who actually fulfill the regional indication for LAA closure and see at the how many patients who actually offer this therapy. You can see here in the US, it's only 2.3% who's actually is offered LA closure. In Europe, it's a little bit better, but not much. 4.8% of these patients. So there's a huge potential to expand this therapy in the benefit for the patient. It will take at least two things, as I, I see it, two things. First of all, we need the evidence that these patients actually benefit from it compared to particularly NOAC. We haven't seen those tried yet. And we also need to see that the patients who have absolute contraindication is actually doing better uh, with LA closure than no non uh, anticoagulation. ASAP2 is running now, and that's going to give us hopefully solid evidence for that. The second thing is, of course, to have awareness of this therapy. Um, part of, as I said before, part of the uh, discussion today will be how to optimize uh, both pre procedural and procedural and post procedural uh, management of these patients. And I think uh, it's at many institutions you see that more advanced imaging, as in this example with CT scan, which give you a really good understanding of not only the morphology of the left atrial appendix, but also the size, how to implant uh, the device, where to do your transeptal puncture, where to place your x-ray tube uh, during the procedure is very useful and will give you an even better outcome for that. We're also going at the end of this uh, session to have a glimpse into the future. You know that the Watchman Flex is now uh, on the market, it's released uh, and controlled, but it's uh, the first device that has already been used in Europe, and hopefully that's going to provide an even more efficient and safe procedure than today. So we have defined three learning objectives today. It's to understand how to plan an LAA closure procedure, and to learn the procedural step, and finally to review the new features and benefit of the next generation mm -hmm. device, of course, focus on Watchman Flex. Thank you. I think that was an excellent start, and we now turn to Lucas. Uh, he will speak on critical review of uh, current evidence for LAA closure in patients with atrial fibrillation. First, need to get behind you. <laughs> Thank you, Martin, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure for me as an electrophysiologist to, uh, to be here and to discuss with you the evidence today uh, on uh, left atrial appendage closure. And uh, specifically, I was asked to be critical. So I will talk a little bit about what we know and but also a little bit about things that we don't know and where we probably need uh, more answers. These are my uh, disclosures. So you're probably all aware that there is a lot of evidence already on left atrial appendage closure, and most of that comes yeah. from the Watchman device. There's obviously also registry data from um, the Amulet uh, Amplatzer device, but especially the randomized clinical data come from uh, the Watchman, from the Protect AF and the Prevail. And you have probably seen these trials before. These were done in patients that were tolerant to vitamin K, uh, antagonist therapy, and these were patients with uh, uh, in increased risk for stroke, and some of them also had increased risk for bleeding, but they were all tolerant for vitamin K antagonists. And these patients were randomized between the device and uh, anticoagulation with vitamin K antagonists. And if we look at the overall uh, data, this is the five-year follow-up of the combined uh, data from Protect AF and Prevail, then we see that these data look good. Overall, Watchman uh, left atrial appendage closure was non-inferior to vitamin K antagonists for the endpoint of uh, stroke, TIA, systemic embolism. 
And we also saw a lot of good uh, uh, other features, less bleeding in the uh, left atrial appendage closure group and lower mortality in the left atrial appendage closure group. And obviously these things have to do with the fact that you can reduce anticoagulation to antiplatelet therapy. So this looks good and all looks promising. Obviously, there's also real uh, life data, real world practical data, which is mostly in patients with a contraindication for anticoagulation, which I will come back to later. And uh, a large registry that was done with the watchman is the evolution, and the two-year data of the evolution have just been published in Circulation Arrhythmia and Electrophysiology. So these were real world, uh, real in real life practice patients that we uh, enrolled and registered in this trial, looking at the outcome of watchman left atrial appendage closure in these patients more than 1,000 patients throughout Europe, uh, Russia, Middle East, in 47 centers. And here we see the outcome, and this was already published in the European Heart Journal uh, a few years ago. We see that from the beginning, where we had a learning curve to implant these devices, that we see that the safety of the implant is much better now. This was already better in CAP and Prevail, where we had um, experience in, with implanting these devices. And you see that with more experience in evolution, the latest data look even better with only 2.5% procedural uh, uh, adverse events, and most of these events are obviously manageable and are not uh, serious events that uh, really uh, cause life-lasting uh, disabilities. And when we look at the outcome and the efficacy of the device, we see that after two years follow-up, we see that where the expected stroke rate in these patients, if you don't treat them with anything, is 7.2, that the actual stroke rate is 1.3 per 100 patient years. So you see a huge reduction in stroke uh, by implanting the watchman in these patients. And also if you look at combined endpoint stroke, TIA, and systemic embolism, again that huge reduction uh, of 80% in uh, stroke, actual stroke rate compared to what you would expect if you do not treat these patients. Also, bleeding was a lot better, again here, because we can uh, get rid of, of uh, anticoagulation in these patients. You see that the expected bleeding rate was 5 uh, per 100 patient years, and the actual bleeding rate was lower, was 2.7. So that's almost a 50% reduction in bleeding in these patients as well. So also this looks very well. Similar data are there for the Amplatzer registry. This is from a registry that was already published some time ago. 60% reduction in uh, stroke and bleeding also for uh, other left atrial appendage closure device uh, therapy. So this all points into the same direction when you compare, when you compare appendage closure to anticoagulation or even to aspirin, you see that uh, it is uh, under the line for uh, uh, anticoagulation, for oral anticoagulation, oral anticoagulation with vitamin K antagonist, and is uh, actually doing uh, very well. So this all looks in, points into the direction that appendage closure is doing what it's supposed to do. So this is all fine, and I think this has driven uh, the, the therapy in the world tremendously, also because finally in the US there is uh, adoption of the therapy now, and we now have many implants. I don't even know how, much, how many we have currently, more than 30,000, I think worldwide may even be more. Uh, so there's a lot of patients that have currently been treated now with the device and seem to do very well. So what don't we know about PROTECT and PREVAIL and what things do we need to know uh, to get this therapy further? Well, one of the other things that was not uh, as we wanted it was that there, were, there seemed to be more ischemic strokes in the arm uh, uh, of watchmen. So the question is, what drives that tendency to have, still have ischemic strokes in these patients? Although overall it seems to look well, there are still groups and there are still apparently situations where you can still have ischemic stroke despite the fact that you have a left atrial appendage closure device. So what is driving those ischemic strokes? Well, first of all, if we look at evolution and we look at the risk, we see that patients with a low risk don't have stroke. Patients with a CHATS uh, VAS score of less than three, there were zero strokes in the arm. So it seems to be that there are maybe comorbidities or other factors that play a role here. Um, and that could be that at higher chest fast scores, there are other things that we need to concern, uh, to be concerned about, and not only the left atrial appendage. So a general atherosclerotic state, a thrombotic state, or a systemic disease or a systemic state that may still be responsible for stroke in these patients. And that may have nothing to do with uh, appendage closure. There's obviously competing risks in these patients. And the other important part, which has uh, become apparent in the last two years, that we still need to look at and be concerned about device-related thrombus. 
when we look at uh, Paddy's closure device, then we see that overall there's about a 4% um, uh, incidence of uh, device-related thrombus in patients with uh, appendage closure devices, in this case a watchman and the ACP and amulet. And if we look at uh, an another analysis, a data analysis of PROTECT, PREVAIL and the CAP1 and 2, this was looked again systematically. Also there we saw a 3.7% uh, <coughs> uh, device-related thrombus rate, but also ischemic stroke, although it was still low, 1.8 uh, per 100 patient years. When you really look at these data, you see that there seems to be a tendency that the stroke rate is higher in patients that also have device-related thrombus. So that is, not, uh, that is not what we want, and we obviously don't understand why this is. How are these two things uh, related? There were some predictors, like permanent AF, patients with a prior stroke or a TIA, patients with a larger left atrium and low ejection fraction. So there, are, there seem to be things that drive, still drive uh, uh, device-related thrombus, and the question is how this is related to ischemic stroke. Similar data were seen in the French data registry, or also patients with uh, DRT also were found to have a slightly higher stroke rate. Inter interestingly, four out of 26 patients with a DRT had a stroke, but only one of those patients had both a DRT and stroke at the same time. So we still don't know the temporal relationship between device-related thrombus and stroke. And here again, predictors were prior stroke, um, predictors for device-related thrombus, and DRT was a predictor in this, uh, in this registry to develop stroke, although the numbers are very small and we obviously still need to be careful to uh, make such a uh, quick assumption, I guess. From the Amplatzer registry, this was also observed, 4.4% device-related thrombus. In this registry, there were no patients that had device-related thrombus that also developed a stroke. And also in evolution, we saw patients with device-related thrombus, again, that 4%, 4.1%. And in these patients, also the patients with device-related thrombus, there were, in this case, there were no patients that developed a stroke, and there was only one patient that had a stroke and also had a DRT somewhere uh, during uh, the follow-up of those patients. So there, is, uh, there seems to be a relation between these two things, but we don't exactly understand, I think, the relationship between these two things. Interestingly, in these registries of the Amplatzer, and especially also with uh, Watchmen in the evolution, patients were using much lower anticoagulation already from the beginning with single or dual antiplatelet therapy. And if we look at the relationship between device thrombus and medication, then in this registry in evolution, we did not really see a good relationship. We couldn't find a statistical relationship between the type of anticoagulation used after the Watchman implant and the occurrence of device-related thrombus. And you see that, interestingly, vitamin K antagonists seem to do very well, but also patients that receive nothing seem to do very well. So these are at opposite sides, and I don't think we really still understand what the impact of uh, anticoagulation is on both device-related thrombus and stroke. So there's still a lot of questions uh, here. Uh, when does it occur? Um, do we look hard enough? Obviously, in the randomized trials, there were more TEEs and CTs done. So maybe we are underestimating the occurrence of device-related thrombus. They may come and go uh, and come back again. We don't really have, have no good definition of device-related thrombus. We don't know which are potentially stroke-related. Uh, we don't know the temporal relationship, and we also don't know exactly what type of anticoagulation will help. So I think that we still need to work on that. And as was already mentioned, um, there is a design change going on, and although there were some case reports that, uh, that linked the, the threaded insert of the generation 2.5 Watchman to thrombus, in the next generation, the Watchman Flex, and I think Tim Betts will talk more about that, there is that, that threaded insert is much smaller, and we hope that this may uh, also eliminate the potential for device-related thrombus, and hopefully we will see this in the trials that are now upcoming with the Watchman Flex. Last part of my talk, um, as you've seen, much of the data, uh, especially the randomized data, has been ob observed in patients that were uh, tolerant to vitamin K antagonists, to anticoagulation. And actually, the recommendation even in the EEC guideline is based, uh, is based on patients with, with no contraindication, and it's actually, a, uh, an, uh, let's say, a recommendation for patients that have a contraindication for anticoagulation. So this is still strange. So what evidence do we have for that, and are there randomized control data for that? Well, again, here the data come from registry so far. We don't have randomized uh, controlled rate data yet. This is, again, from evolution. What you see here is patients with a high bleeding rate that had a major bleed 
uh, before and had a hemorrhagic stroke before. And here you see that stroke protection in this population is just as good as in the population without a contraindication. So I don't think we need to worry about that. The stroke protection potential seems to be the same regardless of whether you have an indication or a contraindication for anticoagulation. But obviously we need more controlled data, and it was already mentioned, the ASAP2 trial is underway. This is a trial in patients with a contraindication to anticoagulation, where patients will be randomized to either Watchman or antiplatelet therapy or nothing. And this will give us a lot, of, a lot more information, both on how these patients are doing without anticoagulation, and also how uh, the Watchman uh, helps in these patients to prevent ischemic strokes and bleeding. Another trial that's going on is the stroke close trial. That's uh, also a randomized control trial where they will look at the different at the comparison of the appendage closure device to optimal therapy, which may be nothing, or antiplatelets, or maybe even in some cases uh, NOAC, if people dare to do that, uh, in patients that had a prior intracranial bleeding. And also this, uh, for this patient population, this will tell us a lot about the position of Watchmen and how this may uh, be of benefit to these, to these patients compared uh, to using vitamin K antagonists. And then obviously the last question, how does appendage closure uh, compare to NOAC? Also there, we do not have any randomized control data there, although we know from the large NOAC trials, this is a meta-analysis that was published some years ago, that it seems that the NOACs may be a little bit better for stroke prevention. They still have bleeding, and although they have less bleeding than vitamin K antagonists, that doesn't mean that they don't have bleeding. You see here that the bleeding rate is actually still 3% or in the range of 3%. So there are still a lot of people that are probably not benefiting or that are probably uh, not eligible for using anticoagulation. And there are trials underway as well in, this patient, uh, in these patient populations. This is the PRAC-17 study. This is a study where patients that are tolerant to vitamin K will be randomized between appendage closure versus a NOAC. So this is uh, still ongoing, and I hope that uh, we will get some data of this trial, which is already ongoing for some time, <coughs> that we get data soon. And the other trial is the Closure AF trial, which is a German trial, where patients with a high bleeding risk, but also a high stroke risk, will be randomized to NOAC, or if that cannot be uh, tolerated or is really contraindicated, then they are also allowed to use antiplatelet therapy. So these are contraindicated patients where we will see uh, the comparison in a direct uh, controlled way to see what these devices do against a NOAC, which is something I think that many people are, uh, are very interested in. So I would conclude. Uh, that looking at all these data that I think that PROTECT and PREVAIL have shown randomized controlled data that appendage closure is non-inferior to vitamin K antagonist, but that we are still need to be concerned and that there are still unresolved concerns about the post-procedural ischemic stroke and device-related thrombus in relation to device design and optimal therapy and how these two, uh, uh, let's say, problems are related. And we are now expecting randomized controlled data comparing uh, appendage closure to the NOAX with closure AF and PRAC uh, 17. And we are now expecting uh, appendage closure data in patients with a true con uh, contraindication to anticoagulation, which will be compared where uh, Watchman or uh, Amplatzer may be compared to nothing or just antiplatelet therapy. And I think that these trials will help us further in these uh, difficult patient populations to understand better which patients are the best eligible for appendage closure therapy. And with that, I'll stop and hand it over back to, uh, to Lars and Martin. Thank you, Lucas. This was a perfect start into the session. Due to time reasons, I think we exactly go on. We, you know we are here at a course and not as a symposium. Uh, and uh, that's why we head into the practical things. Um, and I'd like to uh, call Ignacio, who will tell us about the pre-procedure planning. OK. Um, um. Good morning. First of all, I would like to thank the invitation to participate in this symposium. In the next few minutes, I'm going to discuss about the pre-procedure planning. These are my conflict of interest. So the first question we need to answer is, do we need it? Do we need imaging-based planning? Although there are some centers that has described that you can perform an ad hoc um, procedure, I really think that we need an imaging-based uh, imaging planning because uh, LAA morphology is extremely variable. You know that there are, has been proposed several classifications. This is the most uh, common use classification that divide LAA morphology into four categories. 
uh, wind sock, cactus, broccoli, and cauliflower. But there are some morphologies that, that, uh, that do not fit into this classification. For example, the fish tail morphology or the inverted chicken wing. Also, we need to have uh, an imaging-based planning because we need to know the dimensions of the appendage. We, know, we need to know the ostium measurement, the landing zone, and the depth. So taking into account the anatomy and the measurements, do we exclude any patient based on anatomy? The answer to, do, to this question is it depends on the device. With the old watchman, with the 2.5, all of you know that we need a, a depth. The minimum depth, the theoretical minimum depth is 25, 21 millimeters for a 21 device. So there are, this means that it's a limitation for some anatomies, for example, for the fish tail, but there has been <coughs> Several uh, cases reported using two devices at the same time to close this type of anatomy. But with the new flex, and after my talk is going to be presented, all the data with the new flex, the new flex is shorter and also uh, you can cover a wide range of ostium. So this is a case we performed in last week. So it's a fish tail anatomy. You can see that the depth is really, really small. This is the same markers that we used to have. Uh, before, so this is 21, so the depth is around 10 millimeters, so it's a very tough case for the old watchman, but with the new flex, you can see that we were able to manage to put the distal part in the upper low, and we were able to close it without any kind of complication. So I think that flex is going to change the scenario of which patient can we exclude or not based on anatomy. Also, we need pre-procedure planning because we need to exclude thrombus. You can do this with CT or you can do with echo. So now we need to decide what we are going to do. We are going to do CT or we are going to do echo. As you know, echo is available in all the centers, is easy to use, and is contrast free. You can use regular TE or there's the possibility in patients that <clears throat> do not tolerate the regular TE probe to use the micro TE. If you perform CT, you need to make a multiplanar reconstruction images, axial, coronal, and sagittal. Then you need to identify the maximal LAA filling that is in end diastolic phase, and you need to put the crosshairs here into the LA and using an oblique uh, projection, in this case is the coronal view, you place the crosshair in the direction of the main lobe of the LF atrial appendage. With this, you identify the cell, you identify the pulmonary vein reach, so you can take your measurements, ostium, landing zone, and also you can take the measurements of the death. This is an example here you can see. We place the cross <coughs> here, here we identify the ostium, and here you will see that we are able to identify where is the cell so you can take your measurements. Here is an example, sorry. Uh, let's see. So here is an example, you can take both diameters uh, so you can check if it's oval, round, or, or whatever it is, and you have all your measurements. But CT also can provide you extra information or extra tools. So if you have CT, you can fuse your CT images, your reconstruction on your screen, on your floor screen. This is an example. So here you can, you can draw the right atrium, left atrium, appendage, pulmonary vein. So in some cases, can be helpful. Also, you have CT, you can uh, perform 3D printed model. This is a, a case. In this case, we were planning to do a PBL paravalvular leak closure and also a left atrial appendix closure, so we were using an ABP3 device and we check if we can put an amulet device. You see that there's some kind of interference between the disc of the ABP3 and the disc of the amulet. So in this case, we try with a Watchman device and of course, because you don't have the disc, there's no interference. And this is the final result. Here you see, this is the initial um, echo images. So the PVL is totally closed with the ABP3 and the appendix is totally closed with the Watchman and also here with Fusion, you can see the ABP3 device and the Watchman device. Also, you have CT, you can use this new technology that is called FIOPS. So FIOPS is a computer simulation that predicts the interaction between the devices and the patient-specific anatomy. You can <clears throat> you send the data of the CT so they, can, they are able to calculate all the measurements that you need, I mean, ma minimum, maximum, diameter, perimeter, they can tell you which is the best projection to work, and also they can estimate the best transectal puncture point. They can perform several simulations with different devices. For example, this is a case of uh, Dr. De Baker. 
So they try a watchman 24, 27, and 30, and different implantation position, so proximal or distal. So looking at this, they decide to use the watchman 27 because it seems to be in the best position to cover the ostium, so they decide to do a watchman 27 in a proximal implantation. This is the virtual implant, and this is the final result, and you can see that it's quite similar what you have in the virtual implant and in the fluoroscopy. This is the post-procedure CT scan three months later, and you see that it's quite similar to the virtual implant. So despite all this information, the procedure itself should be done with echo. So you can use intracardiac echo. You can use micro T or mini um, T probe, or the regular T probe that you can get explained and 3D. Just to finish, I want to present, to share with, with you one case, our current strategy in our center is to perform CT in all the patients. So with the CT, we get an idea of the morphology, the anatomy of the appendage, and we get all the measurements, as I said. So we get minimum, maximum diameter, perimeter, and the depth. Once we have all this information, we perform the procedure with micro T. This is the quality of images that you can get. So you can get exactly the same planes as we are used to get with the regular probe, so 0, 45, 90, and 135, and in the last two years, we have been using just micro to e for all the cases that we have done, and this is going to be published probably next week in Jack Intervention. Also in this case, we use Fusion because we have CT pre. So here you see, this is the best puncture side, so we make the punch exactly uh, in, in, the, uh, in the position that the CT tells us that is the best place. This is the line to be really coaxial, to the appendix, and here, this is the working projection, so here we are able to draw a line to know where is the landing zone, where is the cirque, and which is the best projection to work with. This is the cranial view. Again, it's not an easy case, because it's a chicken wing anatomy, and the depth is really, really small. Again, it should be something around 10 millimeters, or at least less than 15. This is with fusion. This is the caudal view. In the caudal view, you get exactly the same chicken wing anatomy, and with a small depth. But we use the new flex with the ball technique. So in, with the new flex, you can expose the ball. And with the ball, you can advance, as you can see here. So we get somehow into the chicken wing. And we were able to deploy the device without any problem. So it was a very straightforward case, although it was a tough anatomy. And here you can see with the micro T, you have also enough quality of image to check the final result in echo and the final result with angio and with fusion. So in conclusion, I think that pre-procedure imaging is totally needed. You can use ECHO or CT, but CT can provide extra tools as fusion, simulation with the fee of software or 3D printed model. Thank you for your attention. That was a great talk. Uh, I mean, um, we also use CT scan as a routine for, for the workup, but, but quite a few sites are still using uh, ECHO or do that hug in the CAT lab to, to measure. And, and sometimes there's some uncertainty what you're actually facing and how is the best strategy for the patient. Can you tell us if you want to use CT scan, um, what kind of protocol are you using and how do you ensure that the patient is in the same fluid status as during the procedure? and and, and what phase of the cardiac cycle are you using? Yeah, uh, that's a, a good point. One of the problems is you perform CT is that maybe the volume is not exactly the same as during the procedure. Because of that, I, I insist that we always need to do the procedure with, with echo. So we, w once we cross, we always check again uh, left atrial pressure just to check if the patient is uh, correct, the volume is, is OK. So sometimes you need to get some fluid. So sometimes uh, there has been described that there's a discrepancy between CT measurements and echo measurements during the, the procedure. I always try to trust the measurements during the procedure. I mean, if there's a little discrepancy between our previous measurement in CT, but echo said, okay, this is going to be one millimeter um, larger than CT measurements, I prefer the, always the measurement that you take during the, the procedure. So because of that, I trust I, need, I think that we need CT before to exclude thrombus, to get an idea of the anatomy, because you have a 3D reconstruction and the measurement, but always check again in echo during the, the procedure. You could also argue that if you go back uh, to the early days for TAVI, for uh, transcatheter auto implantation, people were using echocardiography for sizing. And we know that <laughs> it's, the aortic analysis is also an oval-shaped structure, and you often measure the smallest diameter and undersize the valve. 
Um, so I would say here, if you use CT scan, you again, as uh, for TAVI, you have the chance to have the perimeter and thereby have the mean uh, diameter and thereby mm -hmm. have a more accurate uh, measurements. Yeah. And also, if you use that, just remember, most of the sizing charts for LA closure is not based on the mean diameter. It's a maximum diameter. And you can argue, is that the correct way or not? And yeah. also, I think if you look at maximum diameter on echo and on CT, you often get larger number on echo. You just have to keep that in mind. It's often one or two millimeter larger. Yeah, especially with the new devices or with the new flex, uh, it's not a big deal to oversight a little bit. So we are using now more the perimeter, just not just the maximum, because there are a lot of patients that has a very oval shape. So maybe you are, you, you take just the maximum sometimes, especially with the old devices, sometimes you, you don't get the device well deploy so so I prefer now to use the parameter always taking into account the maximum to prevent the formation of leaks what one uh, good uh, benefit from using CT scan is that you have all the measurements up front you do not necessarily need to repeat them in the cat lab if you trust your CT scan and at least in our institution it's hard to find anesthesia covering for these cases so we want to do it in local anesthesia and we often use intercardiac echocardiography one problem about ice is that you can't really have reliable measurements, but it's a good tool to, to guide the procedure. What, what's your practice in your institution? Are you doing these cases in local anesthesia or in general anesthesia, and, and, and how are you doing the imaging uh, during the procedure? We can ask the panel, Martin, maybe you first. I think uh, we have to um, um, state here that this is really depending on the reimbursement system you're working in. And uh, we all know we have to adjust a little bit. We shouldn't compromise on quality. But indeed, uh, we developed LAA uh, closure uh, using TE. Uh, during the procedure, we don't do any pre-screening. Um, because we don't want to, uh, we see this working quite well. And I think we have the benefit that I can uh, teach my nurses uh, proper full sedation, as uh, is done, for example, from the gastroenterologists when they do coloscopies or so. We send them to courses, and uh, we feel quite happy with just me as a doctor and uh, uh, the team experience doing the propofol and the TE. And it's a way to, very straightforward. Um, so I think for, for the audience, I, I would say we have good experience with both uh, um, approaches, both the CT planning. I have to say I also have the parallel to, with the TAVI. I, I would like to do CT scanning, but uh, I can't argue actually that um, there's, there will be a lot of change. But we yeah. should have yeah. the whole so, panel. Sorry, one, one, one point is if you use the micro or the mini T probe, the patient can be totally awake. So it's exactly the same as I. So it's just uh, local anesthesia. The patient is totally awake, so the patient can be even discharged the, the same day. And what is useful of that approach is that you use exactly the same planes, the same strategy, because with eyes, sometimes it's not so easy to get at least two planes. So with that, you have exactly the same planes, and you have enough quality of image to, to check everything. So it should be. But we can ask, maybe, because I'll just maybe rephrase the question a little bit, Tim, because uh, we have a panel here of experts in LAA closure, and I mean, you can do these procedures uh, with your left hand uh, in the middle of the night. Uh, <laughs> but, but remember, it also needs to work in a safe way in, in institutions who have much less experience. So, so Tim, how, how do you see this uh, approach? Uh, so I think there's the ideal, and then what happens practically in the real world, which is related to logistics and so on. So a lot of my patients, they're elderly, and a lot travel from a long way away. And I think for them to come once to clinic, then have to come back again for a CT, and then to have to come back, well, we tend, I do most of mine as a day case for appendage occlusion. It'd be a lot of visits for them a long way. And I think just logistically, it's challenging. And I suspect that eight or nine out of 10 times, it doesn't make a difference whether you've had a CT or not. But there's probably yeah, 10, 20% of cases where pre-planning, may have made you choose a particular device or manufacturer or maybe found thrombus. Although if you do your CT three weeks beforehand, is that too far before to confidently exclude thrombus? I mean, I guess you'll echo anyway. But I, I, I agree that moving forward and doing it without general anesthesia would be, I, I would like that. And, but then the cost of a CT, the cost of an ice probe, some of the, sometimes that's prohibitive. 
can I pass on also to the audience? I mean, with, with choosing the device after we see Flex appearing, uh, there's no issue anymore. Huh? We, we, we should always You're come back. You're my talk. <laughs> <laughs> David. Uh, David Foley from Dublin. I just wanted to um, make a comment from the practical, pragmatic point of view is that we instigated a LAA program in my little hospital uh, 10 or 12 years ago, maybe longer, and we don't ever have an anaesthetist in the room because we can't get them there. And it'd be, like Tim mentioned, we do it as a day case. We don't use propofol because we're not allowed by an anesthetist. We use uh, a highly skilled TOE colleague who talks to the patient and keeps them calm. Give, we give some midazolam and fentanyl like we're allowed to do as, as interventional cardiologists. And we have a very low uh, requirement for postponement in order to do uh, general anesthetic. Uh, I then in a private hospital I do general anesthesia because there's no problem getting an anesthetist in a private hospital. Imagine that. Um, and they turn up and they want you to do more cases. And it's obviously more comfortable and calmer, but it's clearly possible to run a program without anesthesia under local anesthetic uh, with you know average case of about 45 minutes, maybe shorter, and it can be done very efficiently. And the wonder I have about CT and we don't ever do CT because we can't get it, um, is are we moving towards a uh, guideline recommendation or what evidence would you need to accumulate in the ongoing studies in order to make CT a recommendation at the point of referral uh, to uh, improve safety and, and overall applicability uh, of devices to the appendage given the variation in anatomy that we see? That's a very good comment. But I also remember, if you have to change your device during the procedure, you have to use additional devices, also adding to the cost. If you don't have a complete ceiling, you maybe didn't achieve what you actually did the procedure for. So that's, that's, you can argue both ways. But I think we should uh, say thanks a lot for a great talk and, and move on to the next speaker. Markus Sandri is going to talk about how to optimize procedural outcome and safety. Dear Chairman, dear panel, dear ladies and gentlemen, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, I am supposed to talk of optimizing uh, procedural outcome and safety, which means I want to talk about complications, how to make it and how to prevent it. Uh, I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. Um, what complications are we going to talk about? There are some um, more, more general uh, complications which can happen during all a percutaneous procedure itself. It's uh, exercise-related problems like uh, bleeding or pseudoaneurysm or, and so on, and cardiac tamponade, which can be associated with all transeptal uh, procedures. There's more specific complications which can occur during left atrial appendage uh, occlusion, which is, um, on the first hand, air embolism, device embolizations, occurrence of device-related gaps, and, as uh, already mentioned, uh, device-related thrombus. So we don't want to see um, this image, but sometimes you face such a uh, dramatic uh, air embolism to the right coronary artery, typically during uh, a procedure that uh, is usually uh, elective. Um, how to prevent it? Um, when you do transeptal procedures and engage with large uh, bore sheaths in the left atrium, uh, look for left atrial pressure. And left atrial pressure should be uh, at least positive in, in the mean, but uh, my personal goal is 10 millimeters of mercury in mean pressure when I want to proceed with uh, left atrial appendage closure. Um, look at uh, adequate sedation, or if you have it in the room, um, general anesthesia, which makes this um, happening more, more rarely, actually. So if the patients do a deep breath uh, during the procedure, left atrial pressure usually goes down, and sometimes it goes below zero, and uh, your sheath is full of air, and sometimes this can happen. Um, a good sealed sheath actually is also a, a point to prevent air embolism. So uh, there are some uh, devices which do not actually come together with uh, sealable sheaths. Um, and if you have a sealable sheath, um, use the seal actually. 
how to solve when such um, dramatic uh, complication occurs, of course, um, get the patient on a higher volume status, so inflate uh, volume uh, into the patient. My uh, um, recommendation, if you want to use inotropes, which really help during such a dramatic procedure, uh, use adrenaline, which um, um, gives the heart a lot of speed and the air will uh, occur or disappear quite fast. Be prepared to uh, angiography. We might discuss using an arterial line for that patient or an arterial sheath during that procedure. Some people do, some people don't. Um, and uh, of course, uh, be prepared to use thrombectomy devices and specific cardiac catheters. When PFO is present, some of you might be uh, arguing uh, why do not use the PFO for the left atrial appendage procedure. Sometimes it works this way, but uh, sometimes it doesn't. In the, actually, the most of the times it doesn't because the PFO is a um, three-dimensional structure where you cannot um, estimate how long actually the PFO tunnel is and your uh, sheath is actually sometimes really stuck and blocked in a long tunnel and cannot be maneuvered. And sometimes you face a kinked or broken sheath and this makes your um, procedure more complicated. So in the first line, do not use the PFO for this procedure from my point of view. Um, this case actually goes on, so the operators, this was uh, actually 10 years ago, uh, moved on with the procedure and implanted the device. And um, that happened then like this, the device embolized. Um, you don't want to see this, and uh, device embolizations, uh, I uh, say it quite frankly, are always attributable to uh, the physician, <coughs> always. Um, once, once it's embolized, uh, it depends on the device that is embolized, where it lands. Uh, this device, uh, as a ball-shaped device, usually lands in descending aorta. And is uh, with uh, less effort to recapture, in uh, this case, with an end-snare sheath. Uh, we managed actually to, to snare it on the, on the, on the hub, uh, which is not necessary. And in the ages of uh, percutaneous arterial closure devices, um, it's uh, usually not that hard to get these devices out of the arterial circulation when using 18 French or larger sheaths. Sometimes you face uh, gaps. Actually, gaps less than five millimeters are, are uh, said to be uh, not relevant. And the data that uh, we already heard uh, also su suggests that. But I uh, can clearly warn you to just rely on two-dimensional measurement of uh, gaps in patients who have uh, leakages behind or beside left atrial appendage occlusion devices, because this is just the half of the truth. If you look on fuss on your devices, you usually see a half moon shaped big uh, gap, which is also usually larger than five millimeters. And in this case, uh, a 76 year old male patient who was implanted with a watchman he, uh, a couple of years ago, two years after the initial implantation, um, there occurred a systemic embolism. And uh, as I said, the residual gap in 2D echo is just five millimeters, but in 3D, it's a half moon shape, one centimeter long and just five millimeter wide gap. So this gap is really big. And if you have gaps, uh, look in, at least in 3D mode on the, um, on the device. Um, as I said, uh, multi-centre trials from the ACP and same holds true for the Watchman device. Uh, small leaks, leaks seem not have to any uh, related uh, worse outcome in those patients. But sometimes you see a patient who has a leak and who has a clinical event. And when you have a, such a patient, you have to think about treating that patient's gap. Uh, this is one uh, suggestion. How to treat this? On the on the left hand side, you see a, a steerable agilis sheath, which is uh, uh, available in your EP department usually, and a uh, just standard multi-purpose catheter <coughs> for uh, engaging that uh, that leak. And after you engage it, you um, push the uh, steerable sheath forward and implant <coughs> a ABP3 actually, which is usually designed to close paravalvular leaks, and it also fits beside left atrial appendage occluders quite nicely. So uh, treatment of gaps, if they are uh, prone to be treated, um, can be treated percutaneously with such devices. 
Um, this was already mentioned, device-related thrombus occurs in between 2 and 4% of all uh, devices and usually uh, occurs in the, uh, in the area of the hub. And the question is, is it relevant? And uh, we just heard it is relevant. So this uh, uh, device-related thrombus is associated with uh, is ischemic and thromboembolic events. And this holds true for all uh, commercially available devices. And this is a, a big point that can be addressed, and I think it will be addressed by the iteration of the new devices, for instance, with uh, the Watchman Flex device. And still, if you um, have device-related thrombus, how to treat and how to solve such problems? Do you uh, suggest dual antiplatelet therapy, and for how long? Or do we uh, suggest a, a DOAX or a, a new oral anticoagulant, and for how long? And how? to follow up once this device-related thrombus is resolved. This is, I think, an issue of ongoing discussion, and maybe we can start right now, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Markus. So, so what is your preferred antithrombotic regime after uh, LAA closure? So my default strategy is dual antiplatelet therapy for at least three months. Um, there are some exemptions for patients who suffer from thrombocytopenia. Um, those patients usually get uh, no antiplatelets but no X for three months, and if the follow-up echo is okay, uh, we skip that as well. So, so after three months, aspirin or nothing? Um, sometimes for another three months aspirin, if there's another heart indication for aspirin, like coronary artery disease, there's a lot of association with AFib and coronary artery disease, therefore they need um, aspirin um, sometimes. If there's no heart indication, we sometimes skip both, actually. So Lucas, you just published a two years data from the evolution uh, with the data how many of these patients actually came off uh, dual antiplatelet therapy or maybe even off antiplatelet therapy. What, can you just summarize what you, you actually found? Well, as I, as I showed, that the, the majority of patients went off uh, anticoagulation. Obviously, in the beginning, uh, many people were using dual antiplatelet therapy. But also, a, a big group was using only single antiplatelet therapy or nothing. And uh, as, I, as I showed in the graph, we did not see any difference. Uh, we, we did see some th things different in uh, device-related thrombus, but as I mentioned, the opposites were also there. In, in the group that had nothing, it was even better than in the group that had dual antiplatelet therapy. So we don't really know, I think, what the optimal uh, anticoagulation in these, patients, uh, in these patients is. It has been suggested that maybe the depth of the implant may be relevant. Uh, I don't know. We see very low rate of stroke and very low rate of device-related thrombus in our, uh, in our experience. So it, it, it is, I think it, it eludes me still uh, how these relationships actually, actually are and whether they are just uh, uh, the same, let's say, a pro thrombotic state or something like that, or that there really is a, a, that the one leads to the other. Uh, I think we also expect uh, questions from the audience, so feel free to get to the microphone. Um, I think we should mention that uh, there is an expectation that the rate of uh, device-related uh, thrombus might change with flex. Um, the fabric is the same, but the implantation technique uh, is a little bit different with, with less shoulder. And we have to admit, I think the most experience now is in the US. Uh, they've done over 600 cases, and we'll see the data appear quite shortly. And this will be, I think, very interesting to maybe also solve this issue we, we, st we keep discussing with the old thing. Um, uh, what's, uh, what's your practice, Ignacio, in, in uh, Spain uh, as a standard post-procedural therapy? And it's more or less what you have, you have said. So do an antiplatelet treatment, 45 days, echo or CT post, and it depends what you find, aspirin lifelong, or just take everything out. But I mean, it depends on the patient. We already know that there are a lot of patients, 25% at least, that are resistant to clopidogrel. So many times do an antiplatelet treatment, it makes no sense. So I'm not sure if aspirin, since the beginning, is just enough or because we don't really know. Even if they prevail or protect, the rate of thrombosis was 4%, and all the patients received oral anticoagulation at the very beginning. So I'm not sure. We are just keeping the patient in dual antiplatelet treatment or aspirin, 45 days, CT or echo, and after that, just aspirin. Well, I, we're trying to do this because most of the patients are bleeders, and dual antiplatelet causes bleeding. Single antiplatelet causes bleeding. So in the BAFTA trial, which was the over 75s, 
the rate of serious bleeding with, with aspirin was the same as on warfarin. So right from day one, my goal has always been to get them off everything as, as, as quickly as possible. So I tend to do a, a six to eight week transesophageal echo, and if there's a good seal and no thrombus, down to a single antiplatelet, and then I try and stop that as well somewhere between four and six months. Uh, so they're on nothing. And the exception might be if they've got significant vascular disease and you feel the benefits of an antiplatelet um, uh, outweigh the risks of ongoing bleeding. So what, what could be interesting, if you look at the data, the, the, the sub-analysis of PROTECT and, and PREVAIL, looking at these DRTs, when you make more uh, TEs, you see sometimes uh, that these DRTs disappear and sometimes they, they happen after a long period of time. So I think that if we stop using antiplatelets earlier, then maybe they should be also be accompanied by a CT or an echo to at least show that at that time the patient does not have uh, a thrombus because otherwise we are, we are not doing the right thing for the patient then. I would like to add something to your comment, Tim, uh, because with the bleeding uh, under dual antiplatelet, you're, you're raising the point that we've seen in our evolution registry. Be bleeding is actually the most common SAE now at three months. It's not anymore any of the other uh, things. Um, you didn't say anything about pericardial effusion if we talk about uh, conflicts. Maybe I think there's a reason behind it, huh? because it's not happening anymore. Is that it's, it's rare, of course. And uh, as, I, as I said, it can happen during every step of the procedure, beginning from the transeptal, actually. And um, uh, if the transeptal is done uh, correctly in the, uh, in the um, proper, proper way using an echo, uh, so some, some implanters do not use an echo to, to do uh, transeptal, um, it should happen. And uh, sometimes, even if echo is proper, if you have a, an, a, a small fault in the, in the uh, intraatrial septum, you can end up in the pericardial space without noticing it. Uh, just You notice then when you pull back the big sheath and the hole is there between uh, the two atria. So um, left atrial appendage closure is associated with a small rate of, um, of pericardial effusions, but if you follow the rules, it, it should not happen, actually. Yeah, but I think uh, the limitation from, uh, for this procedure in the beginning was the safety of it. Right. Uh, and I think we, we, we have seen that the complication rate is, is coming significantly down with the increasing learning curve. But it, of course, every new site who's going to start this procedure have to be aware that they don't face the same learning curve. I think we move on to the next talk, sure. uh, and I think we already touched some of the discussion. So, Lars, it's been in, going to be interesting to see your post-procedural uh, patient management. <coughs> So, so you can ask why are you what's what's in it for for the patient if you do the post procedural follow up, and I would say first of all, you have to check whether you actually have a complete closure of the left atrial appendage. You have to look for device related thrombosis, and also you have to make a decision what kind of antithrombotic therapy should the patient have. Of course, you can also look for other late complication as late pericardial effusion, device embolization, and so on. But I'm just going to focus here on the three first topics. So starting with PA device leakage. So you don't have a complete sealing between the wall of the left atrial appendage and the device which opening off a flow in and out of the atrium, which of course potentially can cause thromboembolic event, and you haven't gained anything from the procedure. The definition of complete closure is coming from the surgical literature, which is not particularly evidence-driven, but it's stated that if you have less than five millimeter, it's not going to be an issue for the patient. So what, when we talk about complete closure, we're saying that the patient have a leak which is less than five millimeter. But it's not always used. It's been used in the trials with the Watchman device, but some of the amulet devices have even used a leak down to three millimeter for it. And the normal way we assess it is in the CAT lab, during the transesophageal echo, or during the follow-up, often around 45 days after the procedure during a new transesophageal echo. But more and more sites are now also using CT scan afterwards. And you can see this also here in the definition. It can also be on CT scan that you see there's a leak of it. And this is just examples. On the left-hand side, you see this is on using echocardiography to look for the leak and try to measure how big it is. 
and the two one on the right side, hand side is on using CT scan to see whether you can actually still see flow into the left atrial appendage or you have a complete closure. So does it matter to have it? One problem about stating it doesn't have any influence for the patient is that the number of patients who have a significant leak is small. So it's small number of events you have, so this is why it can be difficult to have any hard conclusion. But if you look at this uh, analysis, I think it's from the Protect AF, you see patients who have no leak, these are the event rates afterwards, stroke, systemic embolism and death, ischemic stroke, ischemic stroke and embolism. The ones who have no leak afterwards are not doing better than the ones who have a mild, moderate, or severe. So this, of course, could indicate that it doesn't really matter that you have some kind of leak afterwards. But again, remember, the event rate is very small, so it's hard to draw any conclusion. And the aim of the procedure should be to have a complete closure of the left atrial appendage. And how can you do it? We have already discussed if you have a proper pre-procedural planning, for example, using CT scanning, having a proper sizing of uh, the left atrial appendage, have an understanding of the morphology and where to implant the device, I will bet that you have a better chance to have a complete outcome afterwards. And some people would even take it further to do this 3D printing, putting a device in to see how often, uh, how well it's sealed. And also one thing which has changed during the LAA program, at least with the Watchman device, is that people nowadays using more oversizing than in the beginning, when in the beginning it was about 10% compression rate, now it's mostly about 20%, which also have brought the rate of severe parvalvular leak down. So in most paper nowadays, you'll see it's a quite rare common, less than 1% of the patient will have a severe leak, five millimeter or more, and the other one will fall into the category you're calling a complete closure, despite there could be a small leakage. If you have it, you already saw an example, you can go back in and you can plug it. Uh, the timing if you can discuss, uh, I would recommend maybe wait a few weeks, a few months, until you have a good sealing anchoring of the device when the endothelium in grows, so you don't have a risk of embolizing the device during the procedure, and then you can do it more safely if you wait a few months. The other topic have we also touched about, patient with device-related thrombosis. And if you look across the literature, it's reported to be about 5% of the cases. But again, remember, if you don't look for it, you're not going to see it. And most patients will have a transesophageal echo during the follow-up at about 45 days after the procedure, but not later on. So there could be more cases out there which you just don't realize because you don't do the examination for it. And you've already seen that. It seems that patients who have a device related thrombosis got a higher event rate. They have more cases of thromboembolic events. So, of course, we should try to minimize the risk of thrombo, uh, device related thrombosis after the procedure. If you see it, it often indicates start anticoagulation again and assess for how long it will take to resolve, and then you can discuss how long you should continue at the anticoagulation. You can argue that many of the patients you treat in your practice have absolute contraindication for anticoagulation. But remember, they often have absolute contraindication for long-term anticoagulation, which not necessarily mean they cannot tolerate for one or two months. In a few cases where you cannot give the patient anticoagulation, or you see it's coming back, repeated findings, and the patient may be even having a stroke or other systemic thromboembolic event, it could be necessary to explant the device. It's rare, but it sometimes is necessary. So what is the best antithrombotic therapy? We don't really know it, and it's mostly taken from what we're doing in under, uh, other kinds of cardiovascular intervention. And if you look into this guideline, a consensus report, it's five years old. And I try to summarize it. You say for the amulet, it's dual antiplatelet therapy for one to six months, followed by aspirin for life. If you have a watchman, at least in the trial, what we saw in the Project AF and the Prevail, it was for at least for the patient with low uh, bleeding risk, it was vitamin K antagonist and aspirin for 45 days, 
and then afterwards dual antiplatelet therapy for six months, followed by aspirin. If the patient was at high bleeding risk, the consensus is dual antiplatelet therapy for one to six months, followed by aspirin for life. So most sites will have this protocol. You do your procedure, you'll send the patient home on dual therapy, you'll bring the patient back for an evaluation with TE or CT scan one to six months after. If you can see you have complete closure, they will change to aspirin or maybe nothing. If you still have a, a, a closure, and have a, a, don't have a complete closure, continue your antiplatelet therapy, uh, anti, anti -ther uh, thrombotic therapy according to the risk profile of the patient, reassess if you still have it, and if so, you have to decide what kind of therapy should this patient go on. This is uh, from uh, Lucas uh, and Martin's uh, evolution trial you see here. Follow this patient, real world patient who had a watchman device. And again, the aim was to come off anticoagulation, dual antiplatelet therapy, to have the only single antiplatelet therapy or maybe nothing. At six months, it was achieved in 50% of the patient, one year, 75% and at two years, 95%. So in that way, the procedure is very efficient to get the patient off heavily antithrombotic therapy. I'm just going to end up here with a few slides. This is from all the Watchman trials and the registry, Protect AF, Prevail, CAP, CAP2, ASAP, and in Evolution. 3,000 patients was included. And if you do a propensity score matching, matching for gender, heart failure, hypertension, diabetes, history of stroke, vascular disease, ejection fraction, and type of anti uh, atrial fibrillation, you end up having 1,500 patients. 500 patients on antiplatelet therapy after the procedure, and 1,000 patients with anticoagulation. And what you see is that in these patients, it was almost the same rate, despite there was a statistical significant difference in device-related thrombosis afterwards, so anticoagulation was a bit more effic effic uh, effect effective than antiplatelet uh, therapy. But if you look at clinical events, patients who have ischemic stroke or uh, systemic uh, embolism, that was no different. So just to conclude here, peer device leak may be avoided by proper pre-procedurally sizing and planning of the procedure. Oversizing also seems to be reducing the rate of peer device leakage. And the clini clinical consequences, uncertain whether it's actually imply an increased risk for the patient, but if again, remember, large leaks should be closed. Device-related thrombosis seems to be associated with a high risk of stroke and systemic embolism. Treat it can be treated with anticoagulation, and rarely it needs to have a device expan uh, expansion. And also for the Watchman device, it seems to be fair to use only antiplatelet therapy after the procedure, at least for the patient who had at high really bleeding risk. Thank you. Thanks, that was an excellent overview of all the issues that uh, are in discussion at the moment. Uh, any comments from the floor? Markus? Uh, just, just one um, comment. Um, oversizing does really excellently work with, with uh, ball type devices, Watchman, Watchman Flex. Um, but sometimes does not work very proper with uh, lobe disc um, mm. devices. So if you, for instance, severely oversize a, um, an amulet or in the earlier days an ACP, you might end up with embolization as well, just as a comment. Mm. Other questions? Um, maybe because we already touched that before, we move on to the next talk yep. and then have a discussion in the end. Because I think uh, one can arguably say this will be the highlight of the session. Oh. <laughs> no pressure. Tim, go ahead. The, ti the title of the talk is A Glimpse into the Future, but actually it's already the presence. It's huh? the presence, and you've already, uh, you've already seen half my slides because they've been presented by um, the previous speakers. Um, here's my conflict of interests. So um, I like it, left atrial appendage occlusion because it's a little bit of light relief from atrial fibrillation ablation and VT ablation and lead extraction. So I get to step into the world of the interventional cardiologist and do a 20 or 30 minute procedure. Um, so it's, uh, um, uh, but there are some challenges. And I think the biggest challenge to this is anatomy. 
you may, from the previous talks, be under the impression that actually there's, there's lots of barriers and complications and hurdles. But we do pretty well with appendage occlusion. I mean, from the evolution data, you know, we, we have a, with the watchman, you have a, a 98, 99% success rate at putting a device into the appendage um, with very few complications. And it works. But it is the appendage which is the challenge. And no two anatomies are the same. I think they're like fingerprints. Um, and to date, all, pretty much all the Watchman data has been on, uh, for example, we've been using Generation 2.5 for quite a long time, which has a number of limitations when it comes to certain anatomies. Um, so, for example, when you have a relatively short landing zone, it can be very difficult to get that long device, which needs the depth, which is the same as its uh, diameter, to be able to insert it. And the other feature, which we'll come on to, is how, it's, how the distal portion of the device and the legs are shaped. So the Watchman Flex um, was, was designed to overcome some of these uh, potential limitations, but also to make life easier for us as well as to uh, overcome some of these challenges you've heard about. So some of the benefits of the Flex, flex versus the current version of Watchman is that it has a wider range of appendages you can insert it into. The very narrow, the sub-17 millimeter diameter appendages you can use it in, and also slightly wider ones. <coughs> um, we'll come on to recapturing and being able to advance forward with the device uh, as in a ball shape in a second. But you can see one of the key features of the design is also that you have a lot more fabric relative to struts. So one of the things which is somewhat annoying if you deployed your standard watchman is if it's slightly proud or has a shoulder and more than 50% of it is sticking out, there's a gap under the fabric and you may get a leak. Whereas with the flex, the fabric goes much further down. So that's a shorter device length. The anchors have been changed for more stability. And as you've heard, the possibly thrombogenic uh, metallic screw face is now covered with, with fabric. Um, the strut design is changed so that there's uh, sort of better compression and conformity. Now, if you've been watching what's been going on in the Watchman world over the last few years, you may have realized there was actually a slightly earlier generation of Flex from a couple of years ago, um, which had many advantages, but there, were, there, were, there was a, uh, an unacceptable, low but unacceptable rate of early displacement, and some of that was probably due to how the radial forces were applied, maybe too many proximally allowing this thing to pop out at a later stage, and the anchors uh, positioning as well to help secure it. So a lot of that has been overcome by going back and redesigning. So this is the latest generation. And for me, using the Flex, it's all about the ball, the ball shape which you can create by partially advancing the device out of the end of the sheath. So you go from what is a fairly uh, straight and potentially stiff device, and as you gradually pass it out, it starts to develop this round ball shape. And when it's in its optimal position, you know, it's relatively soft and safe to advance, and you have not yet exposed the hooks, the barbs on the side of it. Go more, and you start to um, begin to get the anchors in. And so um, this is how you might change your technique in order to implant the Watchman Flex as opposed to using the standard Watchman technique. You expand the ball out until it's roughly twice the diameter of your access sheath. And then you can carry on trying to get optimal positioning with little uh, bits of um, contrast. And instead of using those markers which you have on the... Um, uh, on the sheath which represent where the shoulders of the different size device will end up and trying to get those markers at the uh, ostium of the appendage. Now you're actually looking at the device itself and you're using the proximal shoulder as the site where you expect the shoulders to deploy when it's fully out and seal the appendage. And so having this, this um, sort of little ball there means that you have the flexibility to be able to steer and try and get your device into the optimal position. So you can see here, I mean, there's, you know, there's, there's two lobes. This is a bit like the sort of fishtail which you were describing. Um, so when I was in the upper lobe um, and deploying the device, um, it has quite a superior orientation, wasn't quite right, um, I still had a leak. In the lower lobe, it was further in, but again, a similar sort of challenge as it's deployed, just slightly off axis. But 
I could push the ball onto that sort of ridge in the narrow bit and come back in a more uh, coaxial uh, uh, orientation by having some forward pressure to keep it there, which you can't do with the previous device with its open legs until I got the optimal position. So these are the two techniques which you have when you're trying to deploy the flex. There is essentially the one we used to with the Gen 2.5 Watchman, which is when you unsheathe it. So you keep the device fixed and you pull the sheath back in order to get to the point where it's going to pop out. Um, and see where the shoulders are. That's where the shoulders are going to seal the appendage. And you can see it happen in real life here. Alternatively, you can um, advance the flex forward, so you uh, get the ball shape, and now you can push the whole bit forward, knowing that again, it's where your shoulders end up, as the shoulders come forward out of the device, where the face of the device will be. And in, in reality, you actually use a combination of these two maneuvers, but you have this sort of safety of being able to gently push and encourage your device to go in the right direction or simply unsheathe it, which you would adapt depending on the anatomy and the depth of the, of the um, uh, appendage. Of course, once it's in, you just do your standard assessment, looking at um, the position, the seal, color flow, etc. There are some slight differences in what you expect to see radiographically afterwards. You're looking for anywhere between 10% and 30% compression. But the different shapes, whether they're the uh, um, sort of uh, fully expanded, um, uh, in slightly inverted shape, the marshmallow, uh, the sausage shape, um, but you've got quite a range of compression where it still is safe and secure. But probably the one greatest advantage from my, for, I found, and for my sort of ease of life, is the recapturing and redeploying. So with the generation 2.5, if you don't like the position, when you recapture or do a partial recapture, you're left with some of the legs sticking out. They're sharp. We're taught that all you can do is withdraw, withdraw, withdraw. You, and, and then if you get to the point where you're too proximal, you have to take the device out, put the pigtail in, and then advance your, your way back into the um, left atrial appendage. Whereas the advantage of recapturing and redeploying the flex is that once you've got back to your ball shape and you've retracted the barbs and got it down to its twice the, the sheath width, you can twist, advance, come back. It's a lot safer to maneuver it. Also, it feels a lot more comfortable when you're uh, recapturing it. You don't have, if there's a jump forward, you know you've got a soft closed end rather than sharp feet. You were hoping for some data, but actually there's very little available which I, I can present, but I've got this slide on, on the uh, limited market release uh, Watchman Flex data, um, which we're currently part of in Oxford. And so 140 cases to date, but rapidly climbing, 22 centers. It's too early to really tell you about uh, um, outcomes. Um, you, this combination of uh, unsheathing, advancing tends to be the most popular way of deploying it and you get a full range of uh, sizes and shapes at the end but certainly from my own personal anecdotal experience it's, um, I mean, Watchman was pretty good anyway but this is definitely uh, an improvement and I don't really want to go back so if I'm asked to proctor anything can it be a flex please and uh, not a 2.5 thank you very much That was a great overview, Tim. Um, so there's also, I think you mentioned it, the device fully deployed is also shorter. Yes. So there could be some cases in the, with the, I would call the Watchman Classic device where uh, you didn't have depth enough to actually implant it. How is it with this device? So, um, yeah, so over previous years, there's definitely been cases where we sort of thought, standard watchman, there's not enough depth, this needs a, a lobe device, you know, a, a, an amulet or whatever. But the, the, the change in the design here, so it is shallower, plus the fact that the fabric extends all, you know, much further down, um, you've got, you don't need as, nearly as much depth, combined with the fact you can help encourage it in. So I think it will overcome quite a few of the anatomical challenges which we might have been faced with the other generation of watchmen. So previously, I, I thought to myself, I need to have at least two manufacturer's devices on the shelf because there'll be 10% you know, of cases where only one device will work. But with increased versatility, well, flexibility, I guess that's why it's called it, then you, you can make the argument one device will fit all. 
Lucas, what else do we need here in, uh, to actually to bring this therapy forward? Uh, we, we had the discussion before, we saw the case uh, from Marcus where they went through a PFO and it was difficult to do it and sometimes it's difficult to co get coaxial. Do we need uh, more advanced delivery sheets, steerable sheets to, to, to optimize the procedure? How do you see uh, this field moving forward? Well, I think what was not mentioned today is that we already have at least a better sheath because the watchman sheath now has a better uh, seal, so that has, uh, I think, changed uh, the practice of many people. But still, we do not have a steerable part. And obviously, uh, the, let's say the benefit of a steerable sheath uh, can also be its, its downfall because if you have too many uh, uh, ways to, to move with that catheter, people will start doing things that may make the implant less uh, straightforward because people may end up doing their own thing and it also has some risk I think. Being coaxial I think is or is important but maybe less important so with the flex now because we can we can move move in and, and, and I think that the way that the device deploys the coaxial alignment may become less important at least yeah. from the cases I have done so far with flex it seems that with the ball, there is a little less uh, need to be so coaxial because, in, I mean, the rigid 2.5 had only one way in which it would deploy, and if, if you would not be coaxial, then you would get into trouble because the device would tilt, and it, it seems to be less so in this case. Another thing which I like uh, very much, and it hasn't been mentioned actually by Tim, but you see immediately when you uh, implant the device, you see the bubbles behind the, the device actually staying there. So the sealing of the device already from the beginning is a lot better with more cells of that device, and you don't see these peri-device clefts between, the, between the, the, the struts of the device. So I think that sealing part is also, an, I think, a very interesting uh, uh, change from the, from the 2.5 generation. I don't know how the other people think about it. Well, maybe I can ask you, Mark, because uh, now we are all excited about a new device uh, for LA closure. But we also discussed today the risk of device-related thrombosis, uh, residual <coughs> leaks afterwards. Is device closure of LA the only way forward? I mean, we have seen, at least in the US, with with um, epicardial closure with the LARIC device. Uh, how do you see, is, is, is device closure the way what we're going to continue to, to address these patients? From my point of view, it's a clear yes. It's device related um, de um, or device or endocardial devices which will take the lead and keep the lead because um, there are so many limitations for the epicardial approach um, that it cannot be uh, actually um, brought into the, the, the broad space of all patients. There's limitations due to previous cardiac surgery that uh, rules out that patients for epicardial closure. Special anatomies where the left atrial appendage go uh, behind the pulmonary artery, so a backward orientation limit that procedure. And um, the foremost uh, point in that um, context of epicardial closure is that the um, rate of reopened left atrial appendages and not fully occluded left atrial appendages is unacceptably high. It's about 10 to 20 percent after the procedure directly. And um, I'm, I'm not convinced actually in total with that epicardial approach. There might be a, a limited number of patients who might be suitable for that, but in the um, broad field, I'm not convinced actually. There's one more uh, thing I would like to mention that's more from the EP uh, uh, perspective. Um, obviously, we are not only interested in closing the, the appendage, but we're also still interested in trying to uh, have patients have lower burdens of AF. So, so there is also a lot of uh, discussion about combining procedures, and we have been doing this already for a long time, combining atrial fibrillation ablation procedures with an appendage closure uh, device because there are also, uh, let's say, reasons why you would want to have the appendage even isolated. So there's also people that isolate the appendage and then put an uh, appendage closure device in after that. So in this field of electrophysiology, there's also the combination of this device with, with ablation that I think is a very interesting field that is uh, evolving rapidly. And uh, with the uh, option trial that is uh, that has now started in the US, I think even today, I think that's going to be an interesting um, part to see how the combination of an ablation plus a device can even make a lower stroke rate than we know uh, so far. So maybe I can ask you, Ignacio. We, I, I had this slide in the beginning, try to calculate the penetration of left atrial appendage. I know that indication in the U.S. is mostly patient at high bleeding risk. In Europe, is a patient at with absolute contraindication for oral angiocoagulation. But the penetration rate, the number of patients who's actually offered this 
therapy of the patient who could benefit if it is very small, somewhere between two and five percent. So what can we do to, to, to get this more accessible for, for patients? Yeah, that's an excellent question, and I don't have the answer. I mean, probably what we need to show is the data that we have. I mean, we have enough data to show that this patient can benefit from LA occlusion. So I think that there is a lot of clinicians that are not aware what we are doing and what are the, the results. I think that at the very beginning seems to be another toy that the intervention or EP guys has just for extreme high-risk patients. But now with the data that we have, and especially we are able to show that just with single antiplatelet treatment after procedure, the patients are doing fine. This, I mean, this would be a span. I think it's a matter of time. Probably we need to accelerate that time, showing in not just in uh, interventional or cardiology meetings, just in probably we need to go to neurologist meeting, GI meeting, just to show what, what we are doing and the result that we have, because I've, I think that we have enough evidence. Um, let me just add to that. Maybe we can this time learn from the U.S. actually because they, um, well, put this procedure directly to the patients and report to the patients via social media. And I know that it's not allowed in Europe or in special areas of Europe to commercialize the procedure actually to, to make commercials and say if you are on a high bleeding risk or have risk re history of bleeding, um, ask your doctor for left atrial appendage occlusion. So this might be a way. I'd say be careful what you wish for because I think it's it's coming. <laughs> you get re you need to get reimbursement first. It's never going to happen until your area's got reimbursement, and then you need enough implanters. But once you've got once you've got reimbursement, and I think it, there's a critical level where when it starts to do enough, word spreads. Referrers hear about it. It gets into no. For example, it's, we've just rewritten our lo local. Oxfordshire anticoagulation guidelines for atrial fibrillation that has a big paragraph in it and what to do if you have a contraindication to anticoagulation and that goes to everyone in primary care, stroke medicine, so you do, it, it'll get out there and I just see the referrals shooting up now. But Tim, let me ask you a provocative question. <laughs> I would state today we have zero evidence for this therapy. Because in Europe, we're treating patients with absolute contraindication. We have never seen a randomized trial. It's uncontrolled data. Uh, we all think it, it, it's, it's going to be beneficial. But if you look into the guidelines, it's a class 2B. Mm. If you want to change it to a class 1A, if you want to have reimbursement to follow it, you have to come up with the trials. For the patient at high bleeding risk, we have seen Protect AF, we have seen Prevail. But it's against a therapy no one is using anymore, which I mean K and that's yeah. antagonist and not NOAC. So so shouldn't we be careful that we're not just too happy about what we what we, we have and say this is sufficient and cannot convince the, the rest of the world that it's uh, more that more but, is needed. But fifty percent of people on DOACs by about is it two, two, three years are no longer on that DOAC. Yeah, two, two, 20%. But anyway, yeah. that's not the same that this no. therapy is better. No. Yeah. You're right. And I think ASAP2 is a really important trial. And um, I, I actually have mixed feelings about getting reimbursement in the UK because prior to getting that, the only way you got a, a device was to go into the ASAP2 trial. So we were recruiting really well. And, and now patients come along and say, well, I, I can get it. Um, yeah. I, if I could turn back the clock, I would have asked Atrotech. Not to have done, I would have done, asked them to do Protect AF differently. It would have been the bleeders with nothing versus Watchmen. And then when they'd shown that that was hopefully um, uh, very beneficial, then it could have been Warfarin versus Watchmen. But you can't turn back the clock. So um, I agree with all of what's been said. And uh, just to throw a kind of a, a, an imponderable into the mix is um, uh, an EP colleague <coughs> recently restarted a patient of mine that a Watchman put in about four years ago, she's 87, on a DOAC. And because uh, he was in, the, and I said, why did you do that? Patients are watchmen in. Oh, the risk of ongoing cardioembolic stroke is not significantly enough prevented by watchmen. This is a, a prominent national EP expert in Ireland um, who also does LA occluders, but to a low level, and uh, was extremely dubious about the long-term benefits of LAA occlusion uh, in the elderly population. Uh, and that in general he made a statement that EP doctors in general don't believe that LAA occlusion uh, is the answer. 
and that uh, DOAC uh, has still to be considered to be the gold standard, um, even for older people. Um, but and David, that, but therefore, David, trials a, are needed to prove it. This is a fair standpoint to have because you, you have no evidence that yeah. one. Exactly. So when you're confronted with it, it's very hard to argue, other than that I can say to him, well, this little woman had multiple stents, she's on an antiplatelet drug. You add in that, it's high bleeding, that's why she had it. And then the second thing is the surgeons are now invading. There was a letter sent recently in Ireland to a whole bunch of cardiologists and neurologists uh, by a surgeon introducing uh, trans-thoracic, uh, uh, thoracoscopic LAA occlusion uh, and that they're offering this with very low risk and X blah, 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 uh, you know, in a way that is, to me, going beyond what's allowed, uh, in, certainly in, in Britain and Ireland, regarding advertising. And I wrote a, a kind of a nasty letter back saying, who the hell are you and why are you writing these letters? And you should have brought this up at a you know, national meeting or something. So they're the two things that I would throw into the mix is that the surgeon's looking to invade to do a limited, uh, you know, uh, they'll say thoracoscopic procedure. And the other is that even among us, there are still uh, heretics who do not believe uh, and that we need evidence to convince them. Well, there's people out there who think angioplasty and stents don't work. They think that the earth is flat. That's true. <laughs> well, can, I, can I throw in just? I, I absolutely agree that we have that if we have randomized controlled data, that that helps to understand better what it does in this particular patient population. On the other hand, a lot of the randomized control trials that we do are in very specific patient populations, and we do ec extract and we do extrapolate all these uh, yeah, all these outcomes to the population at large. So this is uh, probably something that is not only uh, particular to, to left atrial appendage closure, but to a lot of things that are discussed here in this in this symposium, where or in this in this total meeting, where things are extrapolated to to patients that have never been uh, investigated. So this is something we do all the time. But for left atrial appendage closure, there is there is I think some animals are less equal than than others. I, I get the feeling. <laughs> and you have to warn your patients, but it doesn't make your risk of stroke zero. At all. No. I mean, and neither do DOAX or warfarin. They reduce your risk of stroke because they're dealing one, with one aspect of it. But if you've got diabetes, hypertension, I mean, there's plenty of people out there in sinus rhythm who have strokes. So, so you, you, we shouldn't raise expectations either. And competing risks. Mm. Atherosclerosis yeah. in general. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, thank, uh, thank you very much, Tim. And I think... Uh, I think I'm supposed to wrap it up. I won't show any slides anymore because everything has, has been said. Uh, I would like to give it a little bit more positive turn than we had here in the end. Because what I see is there's a lot of patients that uh, don't get the adequate dosing of NOAX. Uh, the issue of stroke prevention with this approach is not taken. We as interventionalists can have an impact here. If you're not yet doing LAA closure, I think this is the time to get involved because it has become a streamlined procedure it is, on the one hand, challenging, and on the other hand, very predictive what we're doing right now. Um, I think I'm quite sure, different to other procedures, maybe like renal denovation, uh, um, it, will, it is here to stay because uh, we have created also in Europe the data from the evolution trial that you showed uh, that we are getting to a low level of stroke in these patients, similar to the NOAC treatment. Um, and uh, so uh, go out there and spread the word, currently re reduced to those that can't take NOAC. But uh, I also see the companies that we are working with investing uh, into the trials that we ask for all the time. Um, this also means they won't invest into this trial if we not keep uh, uh, pushing uh, a little bit forward with the procedure. And so this is a field definitely to get involved with. Thank you very much. Thank you.